Good morning. Um, so yes, my name is Naomi Kaiser, and um, the so I'm going to give you a quick thing. I just Keith wants me to record this, so um, I just have to do a couple things. Anyway, so um, I was born in the state of Iowa, and uh, my parents were first generation Christians. They both got saved in college, and so even though I had the privilege of growing up in a Christian home. Um, I felt like that because of my parents being first-generation Christians, it was new to them. And um, actually, the, um, the year that I was born is when they actually came into assemblies because they'd been saved through a Baptist church ministry in college. And, um, and so it's like they really valued the Word of God. They really valued um, the believers in the assembly and things like that. And so I felt like we just got taught really well as children, for which I'm grateful. Um, so I, I know we all have different personalities. I had a personality that's very sensitive to sin and people getting their feelings hurt and things like that. And so I actually got saved when I was four years old, um, very convicted that I knew I was a sinner and I knew I did bad things. And, um, and so I trusted the Lord very simply at a very young age. Um, but as I grew older, because I was so sensitive, it, I became a good kid. And, um, and it was, I was just like, I always wanted to do what I was supposed to do, and I didn't want to do the wrong thing. And so that can obviously lead to pride as well. And so I would say by the time I was um, 12, 13, I had become very proud and started to rely on myself to do the right thing and to be good. And um, so the summer that I turned 13, the Lord brought different things into my life um, that really convicted me. So I was at a camp, there was a speaker, um, and then I had some friends at camp, and um, we, were we talked about the things of the Lord, and you may laugh at this, but as many 13-year-olds do, they talk about boys, and um, I remember my friends being like, oh yes, I wanna make sure that the guy I marry has the Lord number one in his life. And that simple statement brought conviction to my life to realize, you know what, I may be good, but I, the Lord is not first in my life. And so if there's a man who has God first in his life, he is not going to want to marry me. And so th in that strange sort of way, the Lord really brought conviction that, hey, you're not who you say you are, who you act to be. And, um, and so the Lord really, I had to really repent and turn to the Lord and um, and that, I would say that at that point is when I really wanted to follow the Lord. I wanted to read my Bible. I wanted to pray. And I wanted to grow close to him. And um, so anyway, so I, I feel like I had a very um, normal <laughs> life after that. And then I went away to college. Um, so I went to Iowa State University. And I studied animal science. And while I was there, um, I lived on a dorm floor. And... At the beginning of the year, I, we figured out that there's about five other girls that were believers on that dorm floor, and um, not because of me, I'm not a great evangelist, but because of some other of these believers. There, by the end of the first semester, there was 10 of us who, would, who are now believers. And so when the second semester started, they were all like, Naomi, you've been saved the longest of any of us. Can you teach us the Bible? And I was kind of whoa, I've never thought about doing anything like this before. And, but the Lord really pushed me to start doing Bible studies. And um, so I started with these few girls, but I also moved on to you know, um, helping in the assembly that was there with their um, junior high girls in their high school and, um, and just doing Bible studies with different girls at different times. And so I felt like the Lord really um, helped me to do that. It wasn't like I was this strong personality. <laughs> Anyway, so then um, I worked for a research farm um, when I graduated from high school. I mean, when I graduated from college, I'm sorry. When I graduated from Iowa State, I worked for Lando Lakes, their research farm with dairy cattle, and we did feed research and um, learning about um, how the milk affects the butter and all that kind of stuff. And um, I really enjoyed it. I did that for seven years. And then um, one of the camps, I would go help out at camps um, while I was single, and um, so the year I was 27, I actually went to a camp up in Canada. There was a week of camp 
called Discipleship Camp and um, Leadership Camp. That's what it's called. Anyway, um, Keith was one of the speakers there. So that's where we met each other. We did not talk to each other all week long <laughs> until the very last day. Um, but we at least met each other there. And then there was a Rise Up conference in December. This is 2003. And um, again, we saw each other there. Um, but we really did not talk to each other very much. Um, but we had some friends that had moved from Iowa, where I was from, to Pennsylvania, where Keith is from. And um, he was eating lunch with them. And I stopped to say hello to these old friends of mine. And um, they said, and I, as I was leaving the table, I said, oh, hi, Keith, good to see you again. And so I left, they turned to Keith and they say, you know Naomi? And he's like, well, yeah. And they're like, you should write her, you should email her, you should call her, you know, they were really emphatic that he should get to know me. So, um, so anyway, we obviously lived in two different states far apart, and, um, but we really considered that it was the Lord who put us together that he started to pray about writing to me. And, um, and so six months later, five months later, he did. And um, so our relationship was totally a long distance correspondence. He started emailing me, then he started to call me every day. And then he's like, after three weeks, he said, I'm gonna marry you. <laughs> and I thought he was crazy. But um, the Lord, after three weeks after that, the Lord just through prayer just showed me, yes, this was the man I should marry. And obviously we did not know each other very well. Um, it is, but we really see um, how the Lord put us together and helped us to um, do what the Lord wants us to do. And um, obviously my life changed a lot because Keith was already a full-time preacher at that point. And um, so I switched from working with cattle to helping Keith out and yet um, we're thankful for the different ways the Lord has put us together to be helped. But anyway, um, that's just a little bit about me, background-wise. Um, so today, I want to talk to you all about my title. I don't know if it's printed or not, but Roji asked me for one. I said it was clinging to comfort or clinging to the Lord. And um, if we can turn to Ruth chapter 1. I know we've read it many times um, all together. Um, so I'm going to, basically the idea is contrasting Orpah and Ruth's response to Naomi and um, and so we'll start in Ruth but we're really jumping off from there into some other scriptures so if we want to turn to Ruth chapter 1 and um, we're going to just start at verse 6 and read to verse 18 then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread Therefore she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. Forever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Now, obviously, in this passage, Naomi's trying to convince both of her daughter-in-law's, hey, you stay here. You're from Moab. This is where your family are. I'm sure that you're all aware of culture, you know, that it's your family that puts you together with your spouse. And, um, and so she knew if Ruth was probably a young woman still and um, that her family would be... Is, 
her support system, you know? And so she could go back to her parents' house, they could take care of her. Whether they arranged another marriage is a, I have no idea. Um, but anyway, the, and so she's saying, this is what you know. And yet, if we stop and think about Naomi, um, I don't know how many of you all have moved in your lives, but um, usually, none of us just make a decision, I'm gonna leave tomorrow. We usually think about it for a while. And so as I consider Naomi thinking about, you know what, my husband's gone, my sons are gone. Um, I wanna go back to Israel. You know, and I'm sure that she's thinking about this and she probably starts talking about it because she's got these two women in her house and she is remembering all the good things that were back in Israel. She's remembering the Lord. And obviously this is impacting Ruth. And, um, and I think about how we, um, anyway, um, that so much of our life we are driven by comfort in a certain way, okay? And that whenever we take a risk, it's because um, the unknown is gonna be better than how bad the known is, if that makes sense, okay? And um, when I look at Ruth, she says, I know Naomi, and I'm getting to know her God. And those things that I know are better to me than what I know of my homeland. And so she's ready to move with Naomi. And um, I started to think about all the different people in the Bible who have moved. So obviously the most famous would be Abraham, the Lord calling him to go in, um, to the land that he would show him. And then um, Isaac, is, it seems like he moved around a certain amount, and Jacob, but Jacob obviously was told by the Lord to go to Egypt. He moved his whole family to Egypt when Joseph was down there. And then, of course, 400 years later, Moses is leading the people of Israel back to Egypt. I mean, not back from Egypt to Israel. And, um, and then you move forward. I'm not an expert on the history. That's Keith. So anyway, however many years later, when the, the people were taken into captivity. So we have Daniel. We have Jeremiah um, being taken into captivity. And then um, we have Ezra and Nehemiah, people who came back. And then, of course, after the Bible times, um, Christians have been dispersed all over the world through persecution. And, um, and even today, obviously, we live in a country where people came from somewhere else to get here. <laughs> so um, anyway, so I start thinking about all these people who moved. And it oft, often it comes in two different categories. There's some people who are pushed out by circumstances. I think of my own family, um, I should say my um, ancestors, who were pushed out of Ireland um, by the potato famine. They're like, this is so bad here. Anything has got to be better. And, um, and then you look at the biblical times and uh, that they were, Abraham was called by the Lord. who said, you're going to go. I want you to go. And obviously there's missionaries who are called that way today that say the Lord wants us to go. And um, so anyway, and then there's combinations, I'm sure, that you think about... Um, the Israelites leaving Egypt. The Lord wanted them to leave, but they're obviously kind of pushed out by Pharaoh being very cruel to them and things like that. So anyway, we think about Ruth as she's um, thinking about leaving, and um, she, she's saying, hey, I, um, I want to stick with Naomi. And the word that really stuck out to me is in verse, um, verse 14 where it says, but Ruth clung to her. And um, so I think Orpah, she obviously did not have a relationship with the Lord, and so she did what, was, what came naturally to her. And yet Ruth, she wanted, she was clinging to Naomi. And so um, in thinking about our lives today, I was recently in someone's home, and um, they, sh they were having some family devotions, and they read um, Matthew 13. So if we can just turn over there briefly. Um, Matthew 13. It's the parable of the soils. And um, in Matthew 13, verse 3. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, 
and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Then we skip ahead to verse 18. Therefore hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed in stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, of, who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. And I find this passage just makes it so clear those who follow the Lord and they produce fruit. And yet we can also see how easy it is to be drawn away. That you start with the stony soil where... Um, where Satan comes in, and he, he's the father of lies, and so there's lies, he's casting doubt on the word of God, and so it can steal the word away. Um, and, uh, or we could be relying on ourselves and our emotions in response to the word, and so then there's difficulty and um, they fall away, you know? And then, um, then obviously today we see so much of the third kind of soil of people who... Um, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and it chokes out the word of God. And so um, that if you look, compare that to Orpah, those are the things that it's like, you know what, I'm going, I could make money. I could, um, just the cares of this world can choke out the word of God, you know, and yet we want to be like Ruth and we want to cling to the Lord. And so I did a little bit of, um, Thinking about, you know, this last year, obviously, everybody had changes, and um, depending on your locality, what state you were in, um, what your personal convictions were, how much change happened, but we all had to at least change what we wore on our faces, where we could go, what we could do, um, who we could see, and of course, there was also the fear factor of, like, fear of sickness, fear of just the unknown, fear of losing your job, things like that. And, um, and it made all of us think about how are we going to respond? And um, when there's stress, how do I respond? Um, that most of us through COVID, we found a new way to function, you know, that um, for, in a purely physical way, for me, it was very difficult to not be around people. And so, I worked hard at like finding ways to be around people, you know, whether it was I'm going to go visit this one person over here and I'm going to go visit this one person over here so that I was not, um, now obviously I have a family with four kids and my mother-in-law lives with us too and a uh, husband, but I still like having more people around than just that. <laughs> and so I would go try to visit people one at a time um, just to be encouragement to them as well as I knew it would be a help to me. And I know that, I mean, everybody has their things that they kind of cling to to help them feel normal. And, um, and the Lord really showed me, you know what? You know, I need to be clinging to him. He's my normal. And he needs to be the one that I'm clinging to when the rest of the world feels like it's, everything's changing and nothing's going to be normal anymore, you know? And, um, and so we... Um, just want to really think about that. Am I looking to the world to give me comfort as, and, um, or am I looking to the Lord? Um, so anyway, let's look at Ruth a little bit more about her clinging. I wanted to kind of follow that word through the Bible, mostly sticking to the Old Testament since 
it is a Hebrew word that's used here, and then, but we'll have a few reference to the New Testament as well. So we're gonna do a lot of, if you wanna follow along, you can flip through your Bible or you can just listen. So anyway, I'm gonna start in Deuteronomy chapter 10, and there's, this is a lot of exhortations by Moses to the Israelites to cling to the Lord, or oftentimes it's translated other ways like hold fast. So this is Hebrews, I mean, sorry, Deuteronomy 10, verse 20. You shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him, and to him you shall hold fast and take oaths in his name. Then um, just over to the next chapter, Deuteronomy eleven twenty-two. For if you carefully keep all these commandments which I command you to do, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to hold fast to him, and again, over another page in my Bible, Deuteronomy 13, verse 4. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. And we're going to skip ahead to Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 20. That you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. Again, we're going on to Joshua, chapter 22. So now Joshua is giving exhortation to the people of Israel. Joshua 22, verse 5. But take careful heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments, to hold fast to him, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. And then Joshua 23, verse 8. But you shall hold fast to the Lord your God as you have done to this day. And I don't know about you, when I read these verses, um, my heart wells up and I'm like, yes. I want to follow the Lord. I want to hold fast to him. I, I love him. He's been so good to me. And yet we also know from these same passages that hear the Israelites saying, oh yes, we're going to follow the Lord. And yet um, they didn't. And we know that the law cannot make us stick to the Lord. And, um, and, but before we get discouraged, I do want to just read in 2 Kings chapter 18, um, verse 6, this is talking about Hezekiah. And it says, For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. And so even here, I mean, we know that Hezekiah was not a perfect person, um, and yet the Lord is saying as a general course of his life, he did hold fast to the Lord. And um, I don't know about you, but for me, the most encouraging thing is for me to see an older woman who has faithfully served the Lord and still loves him, and that's what comes out of their mouths, is just their love for the Lord and their um, desire for him. And just knowing that, you know what, I don't have to depend on my emotions in clinging to the Lord, um, and that it can last a lifetime. I know that we're emotional beings um, from time to time, and, uh, depending on our personality, and yet we can't rely on our emotions to keep us close to the Lord. Um, so going back to Ruth, the same word is used again in chapter 2 as it's talking about her going out to glean. So Ruth chapter 2, verse 8, says, Then Boaz said to Ruth, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, nor go, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. So that's the phrase, stay close, the same word of clinging, okay? And then in verse 21, chapter 2, verse 21, Ruth the Moabitess said, he also said to me, you shall stay close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women and that people do not meet you in any other field. So she stayed close by the young women of Boaz to glean until the end of barley harvest and wheat harvest, and she dwelt with her mother-in-law. And so as we think about clinging to the Lord, 
um, some of these different ways that the same Hebrew word is translated into English helps us to understand the word better. So here we have, she, um, she clung to Naomi, but here um, it's talking about stay close to, okay? And um, so that's just another part of the word to think about as we're thinking about clinging to the Lord is to stay close to him. Now another way that it's used is in a military sense. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 31. Um, Genesis 31, verse 23. This is talking about, oh, I should start in verse 22. This is Laban and Jacob. Jacob is running away from Laban. And Laban was told on the third day that Jacob had fled. Then he took his brethren with him and pursued him for seven days' journey. And he overtook him in the mountains of Gilead. So this word overtook in my Bible, that's where it's the same word clinging. So, um, so he's, Laban is chasing him for seven days and he finally catches up to him. And you can think of him like grabbing onto him or something like that at that point. Um, so then let's jump over to, to Judges 18. Obviously we know that Judges is a book full of military campaigns. And um, Judges 18 is when... Um, Benjamin and the rest of the tribes of Israel are fighting against each other. So anyway, it says, um, oh, no, not in this chapter, sorry, that's a different one. This is um, another event, but we won't go into the details. It says, anyway, Judges 18, 22. When they were a good way from the house of Micah, the men who were in the houses near Micah's house gathered together and overtook the children of Dan. So another, this is another military expedition, and they've overtaken them. Then in Judges chapter 20, this is Benjamin against the rest of Israel. Judges chapter 20 and verse 42. Um, Therefore they turned their backs before the men of Israel in the direction of the wilderness. But the battle overtook them, and whoever came out of the cities they destroyed in their midst. They surrounded the Benjamites, chased them, and easily trampled them down as far as the front of Gibeah towards the east. And 18,000 men of Benjamin fell. All these were men of valor. Then they turned and fled toward the wilderness to the rock of Rimmon, and they cut down 5,000 of them in the highways. Then they pursued them relentlessly up to Giddim and killed 2,000 of them. So the idea of just pursuing relentlessly. And the thing I thought about is that I don't know how many times you guys use this phrase, but sometimes people will say, oh, I'm pursuing a degree um, in chemical engineering, or I'm pursuing a, degree, a medical degree, things like that, okay? And if you think about pursuing a degree, that's not um, a sprint, it's rather a marathon, where you have to get up, go to class, a few times a week, all day long, you know, things like that, and, um, and not just one week, you do it for many weeks, and then you do it for eight semesters, or maybe 10, or maybe more than that, depending on what your degree's in. But if you, it's this pursue, pursue, pursue. And so to have the idea, it, us trying to cling to the Lord, is that we're pursuing him. And um, it's this day in and day out, choices that we make um, that help us to pursue the Lord, um, that it's long-term. Now, there's one place um, in 2 Samuel chapter 20, um, this is talking about um, when, with David, when Judah recognized him as king, but the rest of Israel did not. Um, 2 Samuel chapter 20 and verse 2 says, So every man of Israel deserted David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah, from the Jordan as far as Jerusalem, remained loyal to their king. Again, the same word clinging. They clung to David. And um, when I think about loyalty, um, often I think of this in that idea of um, you're loyal to your family versus anybody else. <laughs> and um, that even in, but even in our family, if I've got a, all four of my kids are all trying to talk to me, and then Keith says something, I'll say, hey, your daddy is talking, I'm going to listen to him first. You know, and it's the idea of, um, or if, like there's, Kids fighting on the playground, you're going to stick up for your brother or your sister um, more than even one of your friends. And um, so just this loyalty, clinging to the Lord, standing for the Lord, being loyal to him um, in spite of what other people 
say or pressure us to do. Um, anyway, so then this leads us to marriage, um, which is the Lord's chosen parable of his relationship to us. And this also um, has this word clinging in it. So Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, I'm sure many of you know this verse. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Um, and this, of course, is quoted again in Matthew chapter 19 by our Lord. Um, Matthew chapter 19, verse 4 to 6. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. And our brother Ray even mentioned this at our devotions this morning of um, how our relationship with the Lord really is like marriage and how... Um, we cling to the Lord, we're one with him. Um, just like a husband and wife are one, that we are one with the Lord and he's not gonna let us go. Um, I did find it interesting, this word is also mentioned um, in Genesis 34, I'm not gonna turn to the passage, but even like um, Shechem and Dinah, that Shechem loved Dinah even though he did it in a totally inappropriate way, that it says that he loved her and he clung to her. Um, and in 1 Kings, it talks about um, Solomon clinging to his wives, even though they were unbelieving wives, he clung to them in a similar way. And so, obviously, the, the marriage bond is very strong, and that's how the Lord wants to communicate his relationship with us, is that same way with marriage. Um, and so... Um, and so anyway, as we think about marriage a little bit, we do say, um, when you think about our spouse, which obviously we're all women, so if you think about your husband, um, it's like, how do, I, how do I cling to him? How do I stay devoted to him? And that's, um, you think about, well, I make time to spend with him. I think of activities that um, we can do together. I'm going to do things that he likes, and I'm going to um, make food that he likes, or whatever, that kind of thing. And um, I consider his needs, and if I'm making a decision, is like, oh, I'm going to fix this or that. I'm going to consider what his needs are in that process, you know? And, um, and if we think about this world, um, when we had our premarital counseling, we, our, this man tell us, you know, the world is going to work at pulling you apart. And it's really true. This world always tells us to stand up for ourselves and to do what's good for us. But obviously, that's not healthy for a marriage at all. And... Um, that we have to work at being together and um, building up one another. And so if we take that with our relationship with the Lord too, that we have to purpose to seek the Lord, we have to purpose to spend time with him and to do things that please him. And it doesn't just always come easily. Um, and so um, that we, in a way, it's like we choose him over and over and over again when those pressures come, no, I'm going to choose the Lord. I'm going to choose the Lord. Um, so anyway, but the, the, these last few verses I want to look at are going to kind of switch our vision from what we are doing in clinging to the Lord because one of the things I think about is like if I'm going to like grab somebody by their sleeve, if I'm going to try to hold on to that sleeve, that's maybe going to last a minute, you know? I don't know if any of your kids ever try to like grab onto you or whatever that it, it, our, our hands don't hold on for very long, you know? And so I'm like, I need something more permanent. I need more than just my emotions in a moment to help me hold on to the Lord. And so I want to look at some verses about how the Lord holds on to us. And um, so I'm going to start in Deuteronomy, again, 28. And some of these phrases where the same word cling is used is in some rather unusual ways, and yet it gets this idea. Deuteronomy 28, verse 21, says, The Lord will make the plague cling to you until he has consumed you from the land which you're going to possess. This is obviously people who are not obeying the Lord. And then Deuteronomy 28, verse 60, 
It says, moreover, he will bring back on you all the diseases of Egypt of which you were afraid, and they shall cling to you. And if you stop and think about a disease, do I try to hold on to that disease? Not really, I'm trying to get rid of it, you know? But sometimes a disease might cling to someone. And, um, and so to me, that's the idea of how the Lord is holding on to us. That um, when we've become his child, he does not let us go. And, um, and so he's holding on to us in a way like a disease holds on to you, you know? Um, so then I want to look at 2 Samuel 23. Verse 10, and this is one of David's mighty men. He arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand stuck to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to plunder. So if you think about that, his, this man's hand, he was like using his hand so much that his muscles, you know, got stuck in that position. And that's the idea of the Lord holding on to us. He's not going to let us go. His hand is stuck. Um, around us. Um, then let's go on to Second Kings chapter 5. Verse 27. Oh, here's another disease. Therefore the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. And he went out from his presence leprous as white as snow. And um, this was the servant of Elijah, I believe. And... Um, Gehazi, um, and that, the, the, again, a disease clinging to him. He sure didn't want that disease, and yet it stuck to him. And the Lord is the one who comes along with us. Um, and then I'm thinking I'm just going to skip ahead to Psalm 102 and verse 5. Um, because of the sound of my groaning, my bones cling to my skin. Um, and obviously, um, we don't keep our skin on our body. It stays there by itself. And then finally, I wanted to look at um, Jeremiah 13, verse 11. Um, and this says, For as the sash clings to the waist of a man, so I have caused the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah to cling to me, says the Lord, that they may become my people for renown, for praise, and for glory. But they would not hear. But anyway, so that to me, it's that whole idea of um, I can't hold on to the Lord strong enough, but just like we put on our clothes, and our clothes stay on our body, you know, that we've put on the Lord, and he, um, he holds on to us just the same. And, and we have those promises, even in the New Testament, if we think about John 10, talking about how the Lord has us in his hand, and the, the Father has us in his hand too. And, um, and so even as we are holding on to the Lord, he's holding on to us. And um, so, sorry, I'm looking for my last page. Okay, there we go. Anyway, so it's sometimes, um, um, so what does this look like in our lives? What does it mean to really cling to the Lord as we're thinking about all these different ways we've been talking about? Is I, to me, it really comes down to, do I respond to what the Lord's showing me to do? You know, that it's such a two-way it's a combination, you know? I think back to when I was a teenager and the Lord was working in my life. He brought the conviction of sin. He brought that desire to pray, to read the Bible. And yet it was me, I had to respond to that and say, Lord, I help, I'm help. i going to set this time aside so that I can pray. I'm going to set this time aside to read my Bible. And um, I think about, I mean, as I moved into being a mom, um, that, uh, I mean, I, you have less time, and yet, we all, you make a plan, you know, <laughs> and you say, this is, if I'm going to get to this appointment on time, you make a plan, and you make it happen, you know, and I think about whether it's using your spiritual gifts, whether it's spending time with the Lord, um, or even just getting to the meeting, you make a plan, you put it on the schedule, and it happens. And, um, and so it's, and as we do these things for the Lord, um, that's, we realize that our relationship with the Lord, we are holding on to him through all these different phases of life. And um, 
There's times, obviously, that we can feel closer to the Lord, and sometimes we might feel farther away. Obviously, we, we can check for sin in our lives. But at the same time, we know that through those ups and downs that life brings to us, that if we are just faithfully um, reading our Bible, faithfully coming and hearing the word of God, that the Lord, that, that relationship gets deeper and that relationship gets closer and we can cling to him. And so um, as we think back to all these different verses I went through that we're talking about holding fast to the Lord, pursuing him, being loyal to him, um, and in a way staying married to him. You know that our marriages, there's thick and thin in marriages and yet it's the same with the Lord from our perspective, not his, of course, but um, of sticking with the Lord the whole time. And, um, and, so, and, and then just remembering how the Lord, he sticks to us. He's holding on to us like a disease, um, like the clothing we put on, like our body being held together by the Lord. And so um, we just are so thankful for that confidence that we have in him, that he's holding us just even more than we're holding on to him. So that, um, I'll just close this in a word of prayer, if that's okay, and then you can take it from there. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much um, for this time to be together. We're thankful um, that we can have the freedom to do so, and uh, we just pray that your word would work in our lives, that we would grow closer to you, and we would um, make decisions each day that would help us to hold fast to you, even as you hold fast to us. pray this in your name. Amen.